Join us for a town hall discussion about the COVID-19 vaccine on Wednesday, February 8th at 6.30 p.m. Hear the latest updates and have your questions answered by leading local physicians and pharmacists. Register now at theboulevard.org or click the link in the e-news. Calling all ministry leaders and church officers, join Pastor Turner and Pastor Terry Wayne Brooks of Bayview, San Diego, as we continue learning how to be a purpose-driven church. Make plans to join us for this virtual training on Saturday, February 13th at 11 a.m. Head to theboulevard.org events page to RSVP. Get ready for our next congregational study. On February 21st, we will continue our journey towards spiritual health and maturity with our Lenten study, Enemies of the Heart, Breaking Free from the Four Emotions that Control You. If you're not in a small group and want to participate in or lead a group in this study, contact Reverend Angel Johnson at johnson.angel at theboulevard.org. Tune in for our February sermon series, Join Pastor Turner as he preaches Good Trouble, reflecting on prophetic courage of Christian faith, the legacy of the civil rights movement, and the call to get into good trouble and live out the gospel today. It's Super Bowl Sunday at the Boulevard. Put on those team colors and tune in on Sunday, February 7th at 10.30 a.m. and 4 p.m. as we celebrate Team Boulevard and begin our February sermon series, Good Trouble. Be sure to take a selfie or an ussy with your family. Post it to social media and use the hashtag, take the lead. Calling all Boulevard couples, we want to celebrate you. If you're celebrating a wedding anniversary this month, let us know by emailing info at theboulevard.org with your name, anniversary, and the number of years you're celebrating. We'll honor you during an online worship experience on the fourth Sunday of each month. The MBCC Youth and Adult Scholarship application process is underway. Applicants must be active members of MBCC for eligibility. The deadline for application submission is March 31st, 2021. For more information on the application process, contact Minister Chris Watson at watson.christopher at theboulevard.org. If you're ages 18 to 25, CRAM ministry is for you. CRAM, Change Requires Alternative Measures, is the Boulevard's college-age ministry that seeks to assist post-secondary students in making a healthy transition into young adulthood. Don't miss our Zoom sessions every Friday night at 6 p.m. Email Minister Chris Watson for more information at watson.christopher at theboulevard.org. Boulevard Youth, the Nexus Pod, Places of Discipleship, is on IG Live every Sunday at noon. If you're a middle, high school, or college-age student, be sure to follow us on Instagram at Nexus Boulevard Youth so you don't miss a thing. Calling all kids kindergarten through fifth grade. Disciple Town is where you want to be. Sunday virtual worship service begins at 12 noon. Click the link in e-news to join us as we learn about Christ and the Bible. And hey, don't forget to tune in to Storytime. New videos drop on our YouTube channel every week. Boulevard, your January health tip is about COVID-19 awareness. COVID-19 is spread through respiratory droplets produced when an infected person coughs, sneezes, or talks. Person to person is most likely to occur when people are in close contact with one another. Do your part to help slow the spread of COVID by washing your hands, practicing physical distancing, wearing a mask, staying at home if you're sick, avoid touching your eyes, nose or mouth with unwashed hands, and cleaning frequently used surfaces often. You can make the difference in slowing the spread of COVID-19 by following these guidelines. The Boulevard Worship Service is the place to be for soul-stirring worship and a timely word from God. Join us each Sunday at 10.30 a.m. or 4 p.m. on Facebook Live or YouTube. Share the service or the worship graphic on social media. Let everyone know the world is hungry for the Word of God and the Boulevard delivers. The Boulevard continues to be a blessing to others. Whether it's feeding the hungry, showing love to essential workers, 
or any of a number of community efforts, we couldn't do it without your generosity. Your giving makes the difference. There are multiple ways to give. Text Boulevard Midtown to 77977. Cash app, Money Sign Mississippi Boulevard. PayPal or by mail. Remember to use hashtag Boulevard Connect to share your watch party, virtual live group, or social media post about how much you enjoyed our most recent service. To make sure you never miss what's happening at the Boulevard, follow us on social media and sign up for our weekly e-news by emailing info at theboulevard.org. As members of the Christian Church, we confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and proclaim him Lord and Savior of the world. In Christ's name and by his grace, we accept our mission of witness and service to all people. We rejoice in God, maker of heaven and earth, and in God's covenant of love, which binds us to God and to one another. Through baptism into Christ, we enter into newness of life and are made one with the whole people of God. In the communion of the Holy Spirit, we are joined together in discipleship and in obedience to Christ. At the table of the Lord, we celebrate with thanksgiving the saving acts and presence of Christ. Within the universal church, we receive the gift of ministry and the light of scripture. In the bonds of Christian faith, we yield ourselves to God that we may serve the one whose kingdom has no end. Blessing, glory, and honor be to God forever. Amen. Greetings. My name is Lionel Davis, and welcome to the Mississippi Boulevard Christian Church. Here at the Boulevard, we are a church leading, learning, living, and loving without limits. And we pray that as you worship with us today, you'll feel the presence of God right where you are. Now, if you're worshiping with us on Facebook Live, please take a moment right now to share this stream and host a watch party. If you're on YouTube, click the bell to subscribe. In this season of physical distancing, we want to stay connected to you. So email us at info at theboulevard.org to receive our weekly e-news. And again, we're so glad and happy that you've joined us today. Now let's worship God together. Listen, the Bible says that he will give me greatness and comfort me on every side. You know it's best for me. I just want to remember your greatness in me. Looking back on my life, I have my share of pain. And no one cares to even know my name. Bound to my chains, I was circled in sin. And your love and your mercy made me great again.
Mississippi Boulevard, we hope that you came to worship with us. We want to declare today that we believe the report of the Lord.
Boulevard family, join with me in prayer. God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, God who has brought us thus far along the way, God who has by thy might led us into the light, keep us forever in the path we pray. Holy and awesome God, we come to you right now just to say thank you. God, through our tears, through our confusion, God, through the valleys, you have kept us, and for that we worship you. God, for the immeasurable ways you've protected and provided for us, God, we honor you. God, for the saving grace given by the life and death and resurrection of your son, Jesus Christ, we worship you. God, we stand in faith knowing that your word is true when you say you'll never lead or forsake us. So God, even as we move in these transitory times, God, that may be uncertain with our health, God, with the nation, with the world, with our government, God, we know one thing is for certain, and that is you reign. So God, run us over with your spirit. As we move on in this worship service, oh God, stand up in our pastor as he preaches, preaches your truth. Move, God, your people to hear it, to chew on it, to digest it, oh God, and to live out your gospel in this world. God, we don't want to be just hearers of the word, God, but we want to live your good news so that our light will shine. God, not that we will live in an existing Good Friday, God, but we will live in the everlasting hope of the reign of Jesus Christ. God, I pray that all that we do, you get the glory. We honor you and we love you and we thank you in advance for all that you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, 
Oh Lord, oh Lord, we need your spirit. And oh Lord, oh Lord, we need your power. Feel this place, have your way, feel our hearts. Here we'll stay, come and do what only you can do. Oh, Lord, we won't move until you have your way. Will you join me in a word of prayer? God, as we open the book, as we stand before your presence and declare your word to your people, I ask now that the words of my mouth, the meditation of all of our hearts will be acceptable in your sight. You are our strength. You are our redeemer. Save, Lord, as only you can. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And the people of God said, Amen. I want to invite your attention to the Old Testament scripture for the lectionary reading for this week found in the prophecy bearing the name of Jonah. A very familiar story, Jonah chapter 3, and I want to read in your hearing the selected verses from the lectionary, which are verses 1 through 5, and then we'll skip down and read verse 10, which concludes that third chapter. Jonah chapter 3, beginning at verse 1, it says this, then, then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was exceedingly great city, three days journey in breadth. Jonah began to go into the city, go on a day's journey, and he called out, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. And verse 10 says, When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. The New Revised Standard Version says, when God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God changed his mind. I want to talk for the moments that I was to share on this Lord's Day from this thought, Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy mercy. It was in the summer of 1971, soul singer Marvin Gaye released a song entitled Mercy, Mercy Me. The subtitle that many of us do, don't pay attention to is what he calls this song, The Ecology. This song, unlike what's going on, is not specifically focused on social ills, but rather on the toxic environment that exists because of the pollution in our atmosphere as well as emissions. In the song, he speaks of the condition of our atmosphere that had almost obliterated blue skies. He speaks of pollution blowing in the air that we breathe. He speaks of contaminated oceans, land that contained radiation. And he speaks of the overcrowding of the land and as a consequence, how animals and birds were being impacted and even dying. He pondered aloud how much from man can she, speaking of earth, stand? What he points to is the reality that environment need reprieve and some relief from the effects of humanity's poor stewardship of God's creation. And as I thought about how Gabe framed the state of the environment, I could not help but see the days of our lives. This 
past Wednesday, we witnessed the end of one presidential administration and the beginning of another. Yes, it brought many of us a sense of joy and excitement. It certainly has given many of us a sense of hope that better and brighter days are coming. But if we're honest, we cannot deny the reality that the past four days are not enough to undo four years of venom and vitriol that has been sown in the ethos of our life and time. We're living in a toxic culture that was created from the poison of lies and the denial of facts. A culture created because of the sewage of our unresolved racial past continues to come up through the manholes of our human relations and flood onto the streets and social media with a sense of incivility and hostility that is unchristian. And certainly, regardless of what faith tradition you adhere to, this kind of behavior is ungodly. And just like Marvin Gaye lyrically pleaded for a reprieve and release for the sake of God's creation, those of us who follow Jesus must plead for a reprieve and release the hatred and bitterness that we have often found ourselves entangled with. We might not know the words to pray, might not know all of the things to ask for, but there is a simple three-word prayer that has been handed down to us from our foreparents that we possibly have said more than we can count when we have encountered moments that have brought us to tears and others that have brought us a sense of terror. And those three words are simply, Lord, have mercy. And I believe this little prayer is enough because the God that we serve is able to answer because God knows what we need even before we ask. And further, we serve a God who is rich in mercy. And as we ask God to grant the world that we live in some mercy, we also must realize that you and I stand in the need of mercy ourselves. This is the beauty of this prophetic book bearing the name of Jonah. It is a unique prophetic narrative that reminds whoever we are, regardless of what we have done, how close or how far we are from God, all of us are in need of some mercy. If you haven't shouted yet about mercy, quite possibly we don't know or have forgotten what it's all about. In Hebrew, it is a word that comes with a connotation of describing the tender, caring love of a mother. It comes with the image of the womb of a mother. Within the womb of a mother, a child is safe from the elements, protected from danger and receiving nourishment and all that is vital of vital importance and as protected of a place as a mother mother's womb is, it's also precarious. A mother can elect while the child is in the womb to abort the pregnancy, which would be a way God possibly exacts judgment on his people. Do you remember in Genesis when God looked at the wickedness of humanity that it repented, that he, he repented that he had made us so he sent a flood to start all over again? But when we receive the mercy of God, God gives us pardon when we should be sentenced to death. And that's shouting good news that when we get down on ourselves because of our mistakes and think that they are the reason we are catching so much hell, we need to remind ourselves God's pardon, mercy, and compassion never run out on us. If we would be honest with ourselves, God knows our tendencies. He knows our proclivities and our weaknesses. God knows our vulnerabilities. And one would think with all that God knows about us, why doesn't God just do away with us? But somewhere in the infinite and unconditional love of God, God makes a determination to give us some mercy. And when you understand that while we were asleep last night, we could have slipped away in the sleep of death or become a victim of some violent intruder through a home invasion. But when we woke up this morning, it ought to be a reminder to us of God's consistent care when he gave us new 
new mercies. God has given me the assignment today to do two things that first to help us to find liberation from our past as we live with an appreciation for the mercy of God extended in our own lives. But secondly, I have an assignment today to challenge us to do our level best to grant others mercy in the ways in which God has so freely given it to us. And if we can receive and share with others the mercy of God, we can live in a way that is pleasing in the sight of God. This text teaches us that mercy can be found when we have lost our way. Jonah's story is one that is known by believers and non-believers alike, more so for the 72 hours he spent in the belly of a whale or a great fish. And although some would dismiss it as fiction, history proves the contrary. 2 Kings chapter 14 and 25 confirms that during a period of restoration and renewal, the word of the Lord was fulfilled as it was spoken by the prophet by the name of Jonah of Amittai. But whereas in this instance, Jonah is known for fulfillment, when the book bearing his name begins, he is seen fleeing. You remember the story how God spoke to Jonah and told him to go to Nineveh and speak against it because its wickedness has come up before the Lord. And Jonah's next move is to do exactly the opposite. You know Jonah has some audacity to get a directive from God and to ignore it. Understandably so, because the mission which God gave him was to prophesy to the people who were Israel's arch enemy, the bane of the ancient world. Nineveh, N Nineveh uh, was known for their uh, legendary violence and terror who boasted of their exploits when it came to torture. And Jonah did the exact opposite because he was in fear for his safety, but he also may have done so because of, of who he knew he was prophesying to, and he felt it wouldn't change the lives of the people in that wicked city, and God would not destroy it as he had hoped. So merely three verses into the 58 total verses that make up this book, Jonah has lost his way. And if we zoom in on him and take him at face value, we see that Jonah is a prophet. His whole life has been given to standing in the gap between God and humanity with his ear to heaven and his mouth to the earth. He is to speak truth to power and power to the people. He is to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. Jonah's task as a prophet is at times to speak to heads of state what thus says the Lord. And at other time he has, to, has the responsibility to speak to the people to give them a word of consolation and even at times condemnation. Jonah knows his purpose is to speak God's word wherever God may send and to whomever God sends him to. Yet when God gives him the command to go to Nineveh and cry out against it, Jonah does not want to do it, which is to suggest that Jonah has reached a place in his life and ministry where, we, where he's lost his way from God's will for his life, so much so that we see in the first chapter of this story that he attempts to do the impossible, which was to try to flee from the presence of an omnipresent God. He finds himself going down into the belly of that great fish and having a prayer meeting and then being spewed out by the fish on dry land. Now, even with all that, Jonah has done to avoid God's will for his life and all that he had gone through to, 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 to flee God's presence. Verse 1 tells us good news, not only for Jonah, but also for each and every one of us. Verse 1 of chapter 3 says, Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. <laughs> this should speak to every one of us because all of us have some Jonah on the inside of us. We have a tendency to do our own thing. We're like the words of Robert Robinson's hymn that we are prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. We miss the mark. We've fallen short of God's glory. We have all been poor stewards of the days of our lives. We've made a mess of our lives. But the beauty of the gospel is that our worst mistakes do not disqualify us from receiving God's mercy. And some of us are like Jonah, who find ourselves at the bottom 
Others of us are like the prodigal son who found himself in a pig pen of a situation. But when either of them came to their senses and made the determination to get back on track with God, God was willing and ready to give them a mercy that they did not deserve or qualify for. But y'all, the text also teaches us that mercy can be found for a wicked world. You know, it should go without saying and just be common sense. But those of us who have received mercy from God personally should be willing not only to extend mercy to others, but to compel others to trust the God who so freely extended mercy to us. When Jonah hears the voice of God calling him back to service, God has not changed his assignment. Listen to the story picking up at verse 2. Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now, Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days' journey in breath. Jonah began to go into the city, go on a day's journey, and he called out, yet 40 days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. You and I, brothers and sisters, need to understand we don't have a right to disregard, like Jonah did, what God has called us to do to those, particularly with those who you might feel mean us no good. It's obviously clear that God wants us to see the magnitude of this moment. The first thing of note that we learn from this is that it does not matter how debased or distant people may be from God. It doesn't matter how great their fall from grace may have been. The mercy of God is able to reach them wherever they are. Nineveh was a wicked city. The people there were well acquainted with immorality and idol worship. They did not have a God consciousness, but we see God deal with them with mercy because although God may have intended to destroy the city for their wickedness, it was an act of mercy for God to send them the prophet Jonah to give them a word of warning and give them a chance to repent and turn from their wicked ways. And my brothers and my sisters, also I want you to note how quickly these people who were distant from God believed God. As soon as they heard Jonah's prophecy that in 40 days their city was going to be overthrown, the next line said that the people of Nineveh believed God. And not only did they believe God, the text records that they repented. This is a powerful illustration for us to consider on this day that in the midst of the wickedness of this world and this nation, in the midst of the unjust systems that bring about oppression, in the midst of the rise of white supremacy, the perpetuation of violence, God is using preachers and prophets to confront the wickedness of this world and tell them if they don't change, they're headed for destruction. We're not called to pick and choose who we are to minister to or prophesy to. We can't choose who is worthy of receiving the grace and mercy of God, but we are called to preach the gospel simple, full, and free. And we not only tell the world that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. But we have to tell the world that we have to make a change and turn around from the path of destruction we are headed down. And when we turn, we don't turn on each other. When we turn, we don't turn to ourselves. But when we turn, we turn to God who is able to hear from heaven and forgive our sins and to heal the land and give what the world what it really needs, which is mercy. But lest I hold you too long, last and finally, we see in this text, mercy can be found in God's relentless love. Verse 10 says, when God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. What is on display in this narrative is that just as relentless 
as God was for the prophet, God was as relentless for this wicked city. And my brothers and my sisters, the beauty of it is that the same God who saw their wickedness from heaven was the same God that saw their repentance. And thanks be to God who is not so consumed with wanting to give us justice or destruction, but a God who's always willing and able and believing the best in us, that he's always standing by and ready to give us the grace and the mercy that we are so desperately in need of. And what I love about God is that God is relentless about extending us grace and mercy. And although this is demonstrated in this prophecy bearing the name Jonah, this is the essence of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That, that you and I were lost in our sins. As the old saint said, we were too mean to live and not fit to die. We were on our way to hell in a dump truck with no brakes, but God wasn't going to allow us to go out like that. God was relentless with his love. He decided to take on human flesh, come into our circumstances, and not only that, to walk the dusty Palestinian roads, to heal the sick, to raise the dead, give sight back to the blind. But ultimately, God in Christ Jesus was going to go to the cross to show us how much he loved us. Matter of fact, he understood that his love was relentless, that it could not just be a word that was spoken with his lips. He was somebody who was willing to put his love on display. And so while we were in our sins, while we had lost our way, he didn't wait for us to get ourselves together. He was willing to take our place on the cross and bear the penalty of death even on the cross and give us mercy instead of allowing us to die in our sins. And so my brothers and my sisters in this season where many of us are tempted to perpetuate the misery that has become a part of the fabric of our life and times, I challenge us to raise that clarion call and to let this world know that there is a better way let this world know that we serve a God who is in relentless pursuit of us, who has already demonstrated his willingness to give us mercy if we would but turn to him. And if we as people and as a nation would heed the words of 2 Chronicles 7, 14, those of us who were called by his name would humble ourselves and pray. Turn from our wicked ways, our wicked ways of injustice, our wicked ways of marginalizing the poor, our wicked ways of the prison industrial contest. My brothers and my sisters, if we turn from these wicked ways and seek God's face, God will hear from heaven. God will forgive our sins. God will heal the land. And what this world needs now more than ever in the midst of multiple crises is for God to give us mercy, to give us reprieve from that what we've been going through, to give us release from this plague. And so my brothers and my sisters, you may be watching on today you might be feeling like Jonah you've lost your way and God has sent this word and saying it's time for you to get back on track and to not be so hung up on that which you've done wrong in the past but to know that God has mercy that he's willing to give us but then also those of us who are believers should not be in a hurry to rush to judgment and throw people away who might have 
some falling by the wayside of life, others who have deliberately and with great intentionality brought pain and sorrow to so many others. We, like Jonah, must proclaim to them the opportunity they have to repent and turn from their wicked ways. And if they do that, God, who is rich in mercy, is willing to extend the mercy and the grace of God and to allow them to start all over again. If you're here today and you want to receive that mercy and grace that God has, I want you to respond in this moment. Don't wait. Don't hesitate. This is what you really need. And I want you to make a decision. And this is a decision you can't put off for a week. No man knows the day or the hour that the Lord Jesus Christ is coming back for us. And so we've got to be ready. And so if you want to respond in faith, believing that Jesus died for your sins and rose from the dead, you can be saved right now. Send an email to connect at theboulevard.org and our team is going to be in touch with you to assist you with the decision that you have made. But then there are others of you who are already saved. You're a believer, but you're not connected to a local church family. And I know we're physically distant during these times, but you need to have a place that you call home and be connected to a family of believers. If that's you today and the Lord is leaning on you to connect with Mississippi Boulevard Christian Church Disciples of Christ, you do the same thing. Send an email to connect at theboulevard.org and our team is waiting by to receive that email and help get you connected to what God is doing. I'm going to give you a few moments right now to just open up your email and prepare to send an email letting us know of the decision that you're making right now today in this very moment and others of you you can praise God for his goodness and his mercy towards us and we ought to be praying now for decisions that are me being made we ought to be asking God to move upon the hearts of people to make the decision that God is calling them to make today go ahead we're giving you a moment for God's goodness and mercy towards us yes we offer God praise, thanksgiving, honor, and glory. Come on, and if you've prayed for the decisions that are being made in these moments, go ahead, give God praise in your living room, in your den. Give God praise wherever you are today for the decisions that are being made for the kingdom of God. Amen and amen. Brothers and sisters, as we come to the close of this time of worship, I want to remind us to remain vigilant, to continue to take care of ourselves uh, during this time, to wear masks, to be sure we're washing our hands, that we're practicing physical distancing, but also stay connected to our church. If you are not receiving our emails, you send an email today to info at the boulevard.org, and we'll make sure you get added to our list serve so that you can be in receipt of the communications that are coming from our church. And I want to invite everyone to remain on this stream um, as we close out today. After the benediction, we're going to be sharing with you a presentation from uh, Dr. James Hildreth. He's one of the leading infectious disease doctors in uh, the country. He's president of Meharry Medical College, one of the leading HBCU medical schools in the country. Um, and he was a part of an independent panel uh, that uh, gave the okay to uh, give an approval uh, to uh, the Pfizer vaccine, to grant it the emergency authorization, um, use authorization. And so I want to encourage you to just stick in here with us for a few minutes after the benediction and hear what he has to say about the virus and about the vaccine. There's lots of misinformation there's even fear um, of the vaccine. Uh, I, the church does not give medical advice, but we do want to provide you with information that can help inform 
the decision that you're making concerning your health. And as always, consult uh, with your own physician. Well, as we go from this time, as we prepare for the presentation, let me bless you as we uh, continue uh, in worshiping God and go out into the world in order to save. The Lord bless you and keep you. Lord, make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift the light of his countenance upon you and give you his peace from this time forth, even forevermore. It's in Jesus' name we pray and the people of God said, amen. God bless you and God keep you. Receive this presentation. Thank you. I'm James Hildreth, the president of Harry Medical College. And tonight I'm gonna to talk about the biology of the virus, how the vaccines have been developed, and give enough background information so that I hope all of us can make an informed decision that will result in us taking these vaccines. So let's get started. I would start my talk by referring to Martin Luther King who said of all the, all the forms of inequality and injustice, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking. And I totally agree with that and we need to view that the pandemic in that context. So the virus that causes COVID-19 is called SARS-CoV-2, and it's a member of the coronavirus family. It's a large family of viruses. That's almost 40 members in that family. They're endemic to bats, but seven of these viruses have an affinity for affecting, infecting humans. You may know that in 2003 and 2012, there were two other coronaviruses that caused pandemics uh, around, around the globe. Some of these viruses, as you see on the right, have been circulating since the 1960s. These are viruses that cause a common cold. And because they are genetically similar, there's actually cross-reactivity between these viruses that belong to this family. You may have heard people talk about cross-reacting antibodies. This is the basis for that because they're all genetically related, which means that some of their proteins share similar uh, sequences and shapes. One thing to know about the coronaviruses that infect humans, the ones that cause pandemics are known, are examples of what are called zoonotic infections. These viruses require an intermediate host that are animals. And in the case of SARS, it was these small handheld pet privet cats. In the case of mirrors, which happened in 2012, it was camels. So unless you came into contact with one of these animals that had the virus, you did not get infected. And this is, these are great examples of zoonotic transmission. Another great example is avian flu or bird flu. When people come into contact with birds that have the flu virus, they get <coughs> infected. And again, this is known as zoonotic transmission. The major difference between SARS and MERS is the following. There is still an animal ve vector that serves as an intermediate host, but once the virus gets into humans, SARS-CoV-2, something additional happens. That is the virus adopted for human-to-human -human transmission. In other words, we became the vectors for this virus. We didn't need animal intermediates anymore. So the main difference between MERS, SARS, and SARS-CoV-2 is that we have become the vectors for this virus. And with international travel and people moving freely around the globe, that's why this virus spreads so quickly around the globe is because we, in fact, are the vectors for this virus. The other thing that's really, really important to know about the SARS-CoV-2 virus, it is a truly airborne pathogen. What that means is you don't need to sneeze or cough or expel droplets to transmit the virus. The particles are so small, they're less than five microns uh, in, in size. That means that if you stand in the presence of someone, have a normal conversation for more than 10 or 15 minutes, you can acquire the virus. And that is one of the other differences between SARS-CoV-2 and other respiratory viruses because it's truly airborne. It does not require coughing or sneezing. Just a normal conversation is sufficient to transmit the virus. And that is why all the focus has been on masks. Because as you can see from this illustration, the infected asymptomatic person on the left at the top is able to transmit the virus to the two individuals on the left but the one with the mask on has a much lower risk of getting infected by the virus. At the bottom, it shows you that if both people are wearing the mask, you have the minimum exposure because whether you're the infected person who's exhaling the virus or the person who might inhale the virus, the cycle of transmission will be broken. 
And this is why masks are so very important in the case of SARS-CoV-2, because it is an airborne virus. Just want to speak briefly about the other thing that distinguished this virus from some others is the spectrum of, of symptoms that are manifested when people get infected. One of those being the new loss of taste and smell really reflects this in a very dramatic way. There are few other infectious agents that we know of that can do this. But the point is that there are so many things about COVID-19 and SARS-CoV-2 that are different from the other viruses that we deal with. And one of them is the broad spectrum of symptoms you may get. There are GI symptoms, vomiting or diarrhea, fever, chills, the usual uh, uh, cough, shortness of breath. But in addition to that, we have muscle aches and the loss of sense of sm smell and taste. The other thing that's really uh, important to know about the SARS-CoV-2 is the spectrum of the types of infections that it can cause. And we can have pre-symptomatic and asymptomatic infections. On the far left, I just want to make the point that when the virus infects the upper airways, it can begin to replicate in the back of the nose and the back of the throat. And enough virus can accumulate to be transmitted. And that results in pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic infection. When the virus makes its way down into the lower respiratory tract, the lungs, we get the release of these chemical messengers called cytokines that cause lots of cells to come into the lungs. The inflammation is tremendous. And in fact, the response to the virus begins to do harm to the body, just like the virus does. And that's because the virus is causing the release of these chemical signals that cause the immune system to go, really go crazy, go berserk. We got inflammation, we got cells. So that, that is why the, in the late phase of disease, we get the severe acute respiratory syndrome. And that's what SARS stands for, by the way. <clears throat> so let me just say a word about the pandemic, because this is very significant. In the span of 11 months, SARS has, SARS-CoV-2 has eclipsed the total number of people that have died from HIV. Uh, because the 75 million people that we know to be infected, we can multiply that number because for every person who's diagnosed, there's probably at least three or four, maybe more, who go undiagnosed. So it's very clear that in less than a year, this virus has infected way more people than has, has been infected by HIV, which has been a pandemic for 30 plus years. The other thing is that even though we represent less than 5% of the global population, the United States represents at least 20% or more of the cases and the deaths around the globe. And this is a very startling thing, that a country with 5% of the population has a fifth of all the in cases and the deaths. And the reason for that is, just being quite honest, the pandemic has been handled poorly at the national level from the beginning. And part of that problem was that the agencies responsible for dealing with the pandemic were hand hand handcuffed by politics. And I will leave it at that. But in a counterweight to that has been that the scientific response the global scientific community has responded to this challenge in a way that we've not seen before. The other thing that's really, really encouraging and significant is we've had the kind of collaboration between pharma companies and public agencies that we've not seen before. And that is one of the things that has brought us to the point we are tonight, the fact that we've had this global scientific response and the collaboration between large organizations, including pharma companies. So the picture in the United States is not a pretty one. And as of December the 17th, we'd had more than 17 million cases of COVID-19 diagnosed. And keep in mind that most experts believe you should multiply that number by at least four to get the true number of people who've been diagnosed with, uh, with COVID-19. We've also, uh, on a trajectory, I think we've already passed this, of having more than 300,000 cases per day, imagine, 300,000 cases in a single day. And we've also mm. eclipsed 3,000 deaths in a single day. Mm. So if we had had a national strategy that involved testing, contact tracing, isolation, et cetera, on a, on a national level, because viruses do not respect borders, they don't respect city borders, state borders, county borders, borders. We needed a nationally coordinated response. And I personally believe that tens of thousands of lives could have been saved if we had that. So one of the things that we spent a lot of time thinking about with this problem is the fact that people with pre-existing conditions 
or comorbid conditions are much more likely to get really sick and to die from COVID-19. As a matter of fact, we knew this early on from China. China is a racially homogeneous nation, but even in China, if you smoked, were obese, had hypertension, asthma, any of those conditions, heart disease, you're much more likely to die. Unfortunately, those kinds of conditions are much more likely in minority communities in the United States. All of these things, asthma, obesity, obesity cancer, diabetes, high blood pressure, and that is why people of color around the country have been besieged by and much more burdened by disease and death uh, in the United States. And as a matter of fact, these are data from July, but the picture has not really changed. As you can see, if you're a black or African American, you were at least twice as likely to, to, uh, to die from COVID-19. And if you drill down to certain states in the country, where you look at New Orleans, Detroit, and Chicago, as you can see, at one point in, Lu in Louisiana, African Americans were five times more likely to die than whites were. Similarly, in Michigan, 10 times more likely, almost 10 times more likely. So clearly, people of color have been really, really disproportionately impacted by this virus compared to the majority population. And the reason is because of the health inequities and health disparities that exist uh, in our country. So the way that we're going to get past the problem that we have, the pandemic, is through vaccines. And let me just speak a moment about herd immunity. Herd immunity is probably a concept you've heard about. It comes from agriculture from many decades ago when they noticed that agricultural animals, when they got infected by a virus, at some point the infections and death would stop. And they noticed that the animals that remained alive had been infected and survived. And that concept of herd immunity emerged from that. And we know that depending on the virus in question, when 60 to 70 percent of people at least are immune to the virus, the virus can no longer spread uh, you know, rapidly through the population. We believe that for SARS-CoV-2, the number needs to be a bit higher than that. Perhaps 80% of people need to be immune to it to slow it down because of its transmission rate. But, but, but the bottom line is that we need vaccines to achieve her, herd immunity. But that means that vaccines must be demonstrated to work in all the vulnerable populations, older individuals, people with underlying conditions, people of color, all of those vulnerable populations need to be demonstrated to benefit from the vaccine. The other thing is that the vaccine trials themselves must include those persons to be absolutely sure that the vaccines will work. The human genome across all 7.5 billion of us are virtually identical, but there are subtle differences in our immune response genes that cause us to respond differently to different things. A great example of that is allergies. Allergies are a manifestation of immune responses. And consider the fact that African Americans are much more likely to have peanut allergies, for example, than whites are, and conversely, whites are much more likely to have allergies to animal dander than blacks are. And because we know that immune responses can be different, that is why we must demonstrate that the vaccine works in all those different populations, because you know immune responses are different. So how do the vaccines work? Well, if you think about how viruses infect cells, in the case of SARS-CoV-2, there's a protein called the spike protein or the attachment protein. It binds to a receptor on the surface of a cell, which is another protein. In this case, it's the angiotensin converting enzyme number two, or ACE2. After the spike protein binds to that protein, it changes its shape and the virus fuses to the cell. That's, there's attachment and then there's fusion. Both of those are mediated by the spike protein. What the vaccines are designed to do is to generate antibodies, as you see there. The antibodies bind to the spike protein, and they make a physical barrier between the spike protein and the receptor, and the infection is blocked. In other words, infection cannot occur because the attachment protein has been coated with antibodies that block its binding to the cell. So the vaccines that we are developing, that are being developed, are designed to create antibodies that will bind to the spike protein and keep the virus from infecting cells. So there are three types of vaccines that are being developed uh, through Operation Warp Speed that I just want to share with you. So there are th we call them platforms. There are three different platforms. So we're going to achieve the goal of these antibodies three different ways. At the top, 
is a very traditional way of doing this. We take the spike protein itself from the virus. We mix that with an adjuvant to enhance its immunogenicity or the immune response to it. We inject that directly into a person. So the immune system sees that protein. It's a foreign protein, and we get a response. That's the first platform. The second platform is also one that has been well studied, and it's actually kind of a clever uh, platform as well. We take a common cold virus called an adenovirus. We cripple that virus so that it can go into cells but not replicate. So it's becoming a vehicle for delivery. But instead of the protein for spike, the spike protein, we're putting the gene for the spike protein inside the common cold virus. So the common cold virus is going to deliver the gene for the spike protein into the cells. The cells then make that protein and the immune, res and the immune response occurs. So we're using a cold, common cold virus. We're modifying it genetically so it's going to make the spike protein. The third platform, which is the one that Pfizer and Moderna have used, that have now been given EUAs, is to use messenger RNA. So I want you to think of it this way. The blueprint for all of our proteins are stored in our genes, and they're locked up safely inside of our, the nuclei of our cells. So those are the permanent blueprints for the proteins. The working blueprints for our proteins are called messenger RNAs. They are made from the master blueprint. They go into the cytoplasm of a cell, and then those proteins are made from that working blueprint. So what Moderna and Pfizer have done is they've taken messenger RNA, the blueprint for the spike protein. They're putting that into a lipid shell. They're injecting that into our body. The messenger RNA is taken up by muscle cells. And as a blueprint for that protein, the muscle cells will then make the spike protein because they have the blueprint now to make that protein. So all three of these platforms have the same result. The spike protein is delivered into our bodies so that the immune system can respond to it in three very different ways. One way we're using the actual protein. The second way is we're using a master blueprint for the protein or the DNA. The third one, we're using a working blueprint or the messenger RNA for the protein. But all three of them have exactly the same result. Spike protein is made, immune response is made. So here just gives you a quick timeline of what has happened with these uh, six companies. So six trials were to be initiated over a five-month period. As you know, uh, Moderna and Pfizer started first, so they're the first over the finish line. AstraZeneca started in August, Johnson & Johnson in September. And now Novavax and Sanofi are going to be doing their trials starting later this month or early next year. So Moderna and Pfizer are mRNA. AstraZeneca and Johnson & Johnson are modified common cold viruses. And Novavax and Sanofi are recombinant proteins. So those are the, the three platforms I described. So here's the way the study is designed. 30 to 40,000 people are enrolled in the study. Half of them get the placebo. Half of them get the vaccine candidate. We then follow them uh, for a period of time. And in the case of these two vaccines, there are two injections, either 21 days apart for Pfizer or 28 days apart for Moderna. Those participants are then followed to see who de develops COVID-19. And what you're looking to see is whether or not the vaccine group gets many fewer infections or disease than the ones who got the placebo. That way we know that the vaccine is working. So let me just share with you what is in these vaccines, because I've heard people ask me about, um, you know, heavy metals and other things. Here's what's in these vaccines. This is the total list of what's, in, what's being injected into your body. There's the modified mRNA itself. There's a mixture of, of, of lipids, including cholesterol. There's some inorganic buffer salts, sucrose, and water. That is what is in that vial that's being injected into your body. There are no preservatives. There are no heavy metals. There are no cellular products. There are no animal products. And one of the advantages of mRNA, it can be totally produced without any of these things. It is a chemical synthesis which makes the quality control and all of that much easier than when you're trying to use biological products. So again, no preservatives, no heavy metals, no animal products, no cellular products. That is the sum total of everything that's being injected into your, into your body. 
Here's just a quick outline of what, what the study looks like. This is just a Moderna trial, but the Pfizer trial, much like this. I just want to point out that injections are given at day one and day 29. And then for seven days after each injection, there's a journal that, that the participants keep to record the reactions to the vaccine. So after, every inject, after both injections, they're keeping a log of whatever symptoms they may develop after being injected. And as you can see, the plan is for these individuals to be followed for two years or more to make sure we can gather data about safety and how long the protection lasts. So the both of these are two-year studies to get the data we need to be assured of efficacy and safety. Let me just say a word about why you're getting two injections. The way the immune system works is the first time you see something in your body that's never been seen before, we make what's called a primary response. And you'll, you'll notice that the axis there that measures antibody concentration is a logarithmic scale, a tenfold increase for each of those marks. I want to point out that when you get exposed the first time, over a period of about three or four weeks, you make a primary response. It's a decent response, but look at what happens the second time you get exposed. We get what is called a secondary response. It can be orders of magnitude greater than the primary response. As much as 100 to 1,000 fold more antibodies are made the second time around than the first time around. The other thing that's really important about a secondary response is we make lots and lots of what are called memory cells. The memory cells are responsible for the long-lasting immunity because the next time you see something, those memory cells can quickly expand and respond. And that's why you're getting one injection to induce a primary response. The second injection is to induce a secondary response, which gives you maximum protection. And this just shows you in a very dramatic way, profound way, just how well these vaccines are working. What we're doing here is we're getting the cumulative rate of COVID-19 cases all measured in days after the time the injections are given. I just want to get, say that this is one of the best curves you could possibly hope for. The case of the vaccine is almost flat, but as you can see for the placebo, the cases accumulate rapidly over this period of time. And this is probably the most dramatic demonstration possible of just how effective these vaccines are. And this is just a summary of, of the, two, the two mRNA vaccines. Both of them are mRNA blue, uh, blueprints for the spike protein. Both of them involve two doses, 21 days or 28 days apart. The viral, effic viral efficacy, which is VE, is 95% for about both of them. And as you can see, one of the things that's really, really important, both of these vaccines prevented severe cases of COVID-19. And that's a really, really important part of the excitement about these vaccines is they limited severe disease, which means that they're going to save lives. Uh, so both of these vaccines have been reviewed by the FDA committee, and I sit on that committee where we spend a whole day going over the data asking questions of both the sponsor, the company, and FDA, getting those questions answered. And in both cases, the committee decided that the benefits of the vaccines greatly outweighed the risk and recommended that the FDA recommend a, a issue an EUA. There is a committee that at the CDC called the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices. They're responsible for making recommendations about how vaccines are used. They have recommended that the CDC prioritize healthcare workers and those who live in assisted living settings or congregate settings as the first priority for getting the vaccine. The next priority would be those who have chronic conditions who are much more likely to get really sick, a severe disease would be next, and then the general population. There is an expectation that as early as March of next year that the vaccines will be widely available. And you probably have heard this, the news stories today that both Moderna, Moderna and Pfizer have agreed to produce another 100 million doses of their vaccines. The original deal with those companies required them to make 100 million doses available, but each of those two companies have now agreed to make another 100 million doses available. So we think that by March of next year, there's going to be tens of millions of vi vials of, of the vaccines available so most of the people in, in the population can get, can get vaccinated. So let me just say one last thing about why the vaccines were able to be developed so fast. because. 
That's another question I get very, off, very often. It is true that 11 months to produce a vaccine is astonish, astonishingly fast. We, we, I will give you that. But there are some good reasons why we're able to do this so quickly. Number one, technology. The scientific advances in technology that have been brought to bear on COVID-19 are really amazing and incredible. Let me give you one example. The genome sequence for SARS-CoV-2 was published in early January, mid, mid to early January. At least two companies, three companies, had identified a vaccine candidate in about 30 days or so. So what used to take one or two years was accomplished in the span of a month because of the technology available to do so. The other thing that you should know is that none of the steps required to evaluate the vaccine, none of the phases, none of the processes have been omitted, but they've been run in parallel. So by having parallel processes versus sequential processes, we're able to shrink the timeline. And the last thing, which I think is very important, for the last three decades, an HIV vaccine has been the subject of intense research. And over that time period, a tremendous infrastructure has been developed to produce an HIV vaccine. So what actually happened was the HIV vaccine trials network became the COVID-19 vaccine trials network. So that pre-existing infrastructure leveraged our ability to move quickly. And these are three reasons, there are others, but these are three main reasons why the development could happen so fast versus other vaccines. So there are still challenges. One of the challenges, how do you manufacture, distribute um, equitably such large doses of the vaccine? As you know, these two vaccines have to be stored really um, cold, especially the Pfizer vaccine has to be stored at minus 94 degrees. That's a challenge. There's also a logistical challenge of getting 330 million people uh, vaccinated with, with, the, with the vaccines. There's also an issue of what do you do ethically uh, to make sure that, that people who really need it in the order they need it will get the vaccine. And then finally, one thing that's really, really important that we're trying to deal with is African Americans especially are skeptical, hesitant, mistrusting of what has happened, and they have every right to be. So we're owning the fact that if you're an African American, you, based on Tuskegee, Henrietta Lacks, in fact, atrocities have been visited upon black bodies in the United States since 1619 in the service of research and medicine. So we have every right to be mistrusting. But the science is solid, the science is just unparalleled. But you should also know that people who look like us have been involved in the process and sitting on all sides of the table. I can't not mention that a brilliant young black woman named Dr. Corbett, who works at the Vaccine Research Center at NIH, was a principal figure in making all of this possible. Many of you may not know that. If you don't know her, Google Corbett COVID-19, you'll get lots of hits. Uh, I'm an African American. I sit on the, the FDA committee that reviews the vaccines for approval. We have people, African Americans, sitting on the ACIP at CDC making decisions about vaccine distribution. African Americans sat on the Data Safety Monitoring Board that on a regular basis monitored the trials to make sure that they were happening as they should be. So this is not Tuskegee. And the other thing to know about Tuskegee is that because of Tuskegee, human research changed forever. Uh, informed consent became mandatory. Data Safety Monitoring Boards became mandatory. So Tuskegee was horrible, there's no doubt about it, but because it happened, human research changed significantly for, for all time. So I think, we can, I think we can safely assume and accept that this is not Tuskegee. This is far from being Tuskegee. So let, let me close by saying the vaccines are on their way. They work really well, but we still got to do things to protect ourselves and our communities because it's going to be a while before we achieve herd immunity. So I'm pleading with you to maintain the mask wearing, the physical distancing, avoiding crowds. This is really important to avoid crowds right now because the level of virus in our community is really, really high. And the last thing we want to do is to be in a crowd. With or without a mask, I would not be in a crowd right now. And so the other thing is we have another virus circulating now. Influenza is circulating. So I encourage all of you, especially older individuals, to please get a flu shot so we don't have two, two um, illnesses we're trying to deal with at the same time. 
And with that, I thank you for your attention, and I'd be happy to answer questions.